In the grim darkness of the Warhammer 40,000 universe, there are few characters more controversial than Fulgrim. Once a loyal Primarch and beloved leader of the Third Legion, the Emperor's Children, Fulgrim's eventual descent into darkness and betrayal has earned him a reputation amongst Warhammer fans as one of the most tragic and reviled characters in the lore. But is it fair to judge Fulgrim without considering the extenuating circumstances that led to his downfall? In this video, we'll be trying to understand Fulgrim, examining his pre heresy days, the infamous snaky perfumed lair blade, Fulgrim's possession by a demon, and how his lack of knowledge about the dangers of chaos and the warp ultimately contributed to his downfall. So, first, I'll set the scene. Chemos, a forlorn and desolate mining planet, illuminated by the cold, dim light of two distant stars. A cruel world slowly withering away as its populace toils tirelessly in a desperate bid to produce enough sustenance and resources to survive. Beauty, culture, and art are nothing more than a distant memory on Chemos, where every available skill and resource is dedicated solely to the task of survival within the few massive mining fortresses that still dot the dreary landscape. Chemos's fate was all but sealed, that is, until the sky rained fire. The fiery trail left by a comet would mark the location of a smouldering crater, at the heart of which lay a child, surrounded by the remnants of a stasis capsule amidst the scorching heat. The child was a boy, flawless in appearance, unmarred by the violent hostility of his surroundings. But yet, the incredible sight of the child would somehow pale in comparison to what bubbled on the ground around him. Gurgling, crystal clear, pure waters flowed from the once corrupted ground, brought to the surface from the impact of the boy's arrival. And so, the boy would be named Fulgrim, the Waterbringer. Fulgrim's growth on Chemos was unique, to say the least. Within a few short years, he'd become physically adept and technologically savvy, outperforming his fellow workers and driving productivity for the factory beyond what others thought possible. He would work tirelessly in the factories, enduring grueling physical labour, pushing his muscles to their limits, and burning his skin in the unforgiving heat of the forges. All this in service to the ruling body of Chemos, the executive, to whom he fulfilled his obligations as a youth with unwavering dedication. As Fulgrim honed his skills and led his fellow workers to new levels of efficiency, he quickly rose to the ranks, repairing machines, optimizing processes, and eventually becoming an engineer himself. It was only a matter of time before he joined the elite ranks of the executive, taking his place amongst the planet's most powerful leaders. But Fulgrim's ambition extended far beyond mere power and prestige. With a keen eye for the state of the world outside his factory, Fulgrim soon realized that Chemos was in a steep decline. The few remaining pockets of humanity were struggling to survive, its resources were dwindling, its atmosphere poisoned, and its people were suffering. Fulgrim committed himself to the impossible task of saving Chemos and transforming it into a thriving centre of art and wealth. It was a monumental feat that would take 50 standard years to accomplish, but with his unwavering determination, Fulgrim rose to the challenge. Not long after Fulgrim transformed Chemos into a world beyond recognition, a desolate wasteland replaced with lush, teeming forests, shimmering seas, and grand seas of golden glass, a flight of dropships broke orbit and soared to the ground. As the dropships landed, long forgotten memories stirred within Fulgrim, and he rode out to meet the outsiders. Fulgrim watched as the ramp of the lead dropship lowered, and a giant figure stepped out, his golden armor gleaming in the sunlight. It was his father, it was the Emperor of Mankind. Learning of Terra, the Imperium, and the Great Crusade, Fulgrim immediately swore allegiance to this man and returned with him to Terra to be introduced to his gene sons. In contrast to the other 19 legions engaged in the Crusade, the Astartes fighting under the banner of the Third Legion were remarkably scarce, so scarce that they barely numbered 200 legionaries upon meeting their father. This scarcity was a result of an unfortunate incident that took place during transportation from Luna to Terra, which resulted in the destruction of a significant portion of the Legion's invaluable gene seed, whilst the sword reserves were also plagued by severe infection, further exacerbating the already critical situation. 
This presented a significant challenge that clearly sets Fulgrim apart from other Primarchs. While his brothers, for the most part, inherited full strength battle ready legions, Fulgrim received a fighting force obliged to endure the indignity of fighting under and alongside other legions due to their inability to support their own campaigns. Eager to lead his legion to conquer the unexplored regions of the galaxy, yet also cognizant of the fact that his mere 200 warriors were insufficient to undertake such a massive endeavor alone, Fulgrim and his legion, with the Emperor's blessing, joined forces with the Lunar Wolves on campaign, standing shoulder to shoulder with his brother Primarch Horus to bring order to the tumultuous Eastern Fringe. Fulgrim's exceptional leadership and martial prowess quickly caught the attention of the Warmaster, who praised the Third Legion as the quintessential embodiment of all that the Legionis Astartes stood for. Fulgrim and his warriors soon established themselves as a formidable fighting force, earning the respect and admiration of all who fought alongside them. Together with the Lunar Wolves, Fulgrim and his legion achieved remarkable victories, expanding the Imperium's domain deeper into the unknown territories of the galaxy. Fulgrim's strategic acumen, combined with his raw power and the skill of his warriors, proved to be a force to be reckoned with and earned him a place of honor amongst the Emperor's sons. Fulgrim's perfectionist nature, which the transformation of Chemos suggests has always been a part of him, enabled him to rise to his challenge and lead his legion to glory despite their numerical disadvantage. His commitment to achieving perfection set a standard of excellence that would ultimately contribute to the legion's regrowth and earn them a reputation as one of the most formidable fighting forces in the Imperium. Fulgrim's commitment to restoring the Legion's strength was not just a matter of practicality or strategy, but also a reflection of his personal pride and sense of honor. He felt responsible for the fate of his Legion and was driven to make up for the loss of their gene seed by recruiting only the best and most noble and most capable warriors to join the Third Legion. This level of personal investment in his Legion's success is a defining trait that sets him apart from other Primarchs who may have been more focused on broader strategic goals or personal glory. After decades of fighting beside his brother Horus, Fulgrim yearned to prove himself and his legion by demonstrating their ability to succeed on their own, even with fewer resources than his brothers. He aimed to surpass the odds and earn the Emperor's name and the honour of bearing the Palatine Aquila to ultimately prove the worthiness of his fresh legion. And so, with the addition of fresh recruits from Chemos and Terra, the ranks of the Emperor's children eventually swelled with newfound strength, enabling them to embark on a portion of the Great Crusade independently. With his newfound independence, Fulgrim proved himself to be one of the most accomplished, skilled, and respected Primarchs amongst the Emperor's forces. Fulgrim's achievements during the Great Crusade were numerous and impressive, with his military campaigns marked by decisive victories and the highest levels of strategic and tactical prowess. Now, Fulgrim was not only a skilled commander and warrior, but also a diplomat, a renowned artist and patron of the arts, a man hell-bent on elevating the cultural life of many worlds, helping his legion and humanity as a whole to achieve their true potential. I believe it is in this way that many make the mistake of labeling Fulgrim only as this arrogant narcissist whose only motivation is to outdo his brothers for a bit of attention. This is only half true. Yes, Fulgrim is arrogant. Yes, Fulgrim is a perfectionist. However, he is certainly less arrogant and entitled as some of his other brothers, such as Perturabo, whose crippling victim complex makes him appear the most arrogant of all. All Primarchs are arrogant. They sort of have to be. It's basically a byproduct of literally being walking demigods. Pre Heresy Fulgrim was a figure who listened to the opinions of others, who was motivated by the idea that every man can do better, who strove to help others embark on the journey to, not the attainment of, perfection, and who not only cared about each of his men, as most were raised under his command, but he also saw them as an extension of himself, each individual a vital part of the greater whole that was the Legion. And now we come to the Lair campaign, unfortunately. 
The Lair campaign was a pivotal moment for the Emperor's children and their Primarch. The ocean world of Lairin was home to a race of snake-like beings called the Lair, and their world was rich with exotic and valuable resources. It was an exceptional world, unique in every way. It was a planet transformed by the use of anti-gravity technology, with gigantic coral platforms that floated high above the global ocean. The planet soon became a target for the Imperium's Great Crusade. However, expert analysis indicated that a hostile action against the Lair would result in a protracted conflict potentially lasting decades. Imperial bureaucracy, therefore, began to consider making the Lair a protectorate until such a time that sufficient resources could be diverted to pacify the Xenos. Fulgrim, disgusted by the idea that any cooperation or toleration with the Xenos was even being considered, set off to conquer it and have it pacified within one solar month. During the campaign, the Third Legion were met with ferocious resistance. The Lair, with their genetically and chemically enhanced warriors, were a formidable foe with advanced technology and incredible speed and agility. The Emperor's children triumphed, of course, within Fulgrim's time frame, though the victory cost them heavy casualties. On the night of victory, Fulgrim discovered a weapon within a great temple, lying amidst a massive perfumed snake death orgy known as the Lair Blade. This weapon was unique, gently curved, beautifully ornamented, and, unbeknownst to Fulgrim or his legion, home to an incredibly powerful demon of Slaanesh. Fulgrim was instantly drawn to the sword, and, as was the habit of many of his brothers, he claimed the sword as his own, a trophy of his great victory. So, the demon-infused Lair Blade started talking to Fulgrim, whispering in his mind. Initially, Fulgrim did not pay much attention to the whispers, believing them to be the result of his own subconscious thoughts. As Fulgrim continued to use the blade, the influence of the demon within became stronger, his personality began to change, and he became increasingly arrogant and self-centered. He started to believe that he was absolutely superior to everyone else, including his fellow Primarchs. He also became increasingly obsessed with the idea of perfection, taking it to a weirdly extreme level where any imperfection was absolutely intolerable. As Fulgrim became more and more consumed by the influence of the blade, he started to lose control of himself. He became unpredictable, erratic, often acting without thinking of the consequences. The blade not only amplified his negative traits, but also dampened his noble thoughts and sentiments. It eroded his moral compass and made him susceptible to siding with the War Master in his ultimate betrayal against the Emperor. This decision ultimately led to the tragic demise of his closest brother, Ferris. After the slaying of his brother, Fulgrim only sought oblivion and turned to the demon within for guidance. The demon, taking advantage of Fulgrim's weakened state, absolutely took over his body and locked his mind and soul away within Serena DeAngelis's perfect portrait of him aboard his flagship, the Pride of the Emperor. His soul now trapped, Fulgrim was forced to watch as his legion fell further and further into darkness, becoming twisted and corrupted shadows of their former selves. It's clear that Fulgrim was not entirely responsible for his actions during this time. The Lair Blade had corrupted him, and he had become possessed by a powerful demon, leaving him helpless to intervene in the tragic events that took place. Despite this, some books, uh, The Reflection Cracked, do not read this book, claim that Fulgrim magically banished the demon from his body, regaining control of himself and deciding to embrace the darkness and perversion brought about by the demon. Personally, I find this version of events to be unbelievable and inconsistent with Fulgrim's character. It's far more fitting and grimdark to imagine that he remained trapped within the painting, forced to bear witness to the atrocities committed by his legion. It's a grim and tragic fate, but it's one that better aligns with Fulgrim's original character as a noble and loyal son of the Emperor, striving to live up to the expectations placed upon him. In addition to this, the lack of detail surrounding Fulgrim's supposed banishment of the demon and the sudden transformation of his personality only served to undermine the depth and complexity of his character. As a loyal son of the Emperor, Fulgrim had been raised to believe in the Imperial truth 
the doctrine that all religions, superstitions, and belief in the supernatural entities were false and harmful to humanity. This worldview led Fulgham to absolutely dismiss the existence of chaos and demons as mere superstition and myth. Fulgham's lack of knowledge about chaos and the nature of demons therefore played a significant role in his possession by the Lair Blade. The Emperor ultimately failed him by not providing him or the other um, tr trustworthy, for lack of a better word, with the knowledge he needed to recognize, resist, and destroy the corrupting influence of chaos. Had Fulgrim been aware of the existence and nature of chaos and demons, he may have recognized the danger of the Lair Blade and actively avoided it, or destroyed it, or, at the very least, the knowledge of chaos would have allowed him to resist its corrupting influence, protecting his loyalty to the Emperor and preventing the tragic events that took place. Anyway, that's it from me, my first YouTube video. So I hope you all liked it and it wasn't too messy or terrible. I've never done any video editing of any kind before, so very much learning as I go. So if you stay with my channel, I hope you will see some improvements as we go. Now, thank you very much to the 24 of you who have already subscribed and enjoyed my so far shitty content. Thank you very much. I'll see you all in the next one. See you later.